today because as always we've gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He is alive. He lives. With that our hope is fully alive and I believe it is by the power of God's good spirit he has gathered us together here today. I pray and hope you are ready to be open to receiving today's wisdom. We're going over step nine spiritual goodness recognizing and understanding that uh, our spirit, it's not about our spiritual goodness as a sense of our own righteousness or virtue. <clears throat> it, it's simply because the person we desire to, to share good with matters, is important, has value. It is about being a spirit-filled person, a person filled with the Holy Spirit and God using us and working with us and through us to deliver his love to those whom he has deemed as worthy or as valued or as though they matter. They matter to God so when we're talking about this, the, the Greek word used for when we're this biblical sense of uh, goodness and spiritual goodness is it's only used in, in the Bible, and it's agathisune, uh, agathisune, and, and again, it, it's a gift given to somebody because of their value, because they matter. It's not a sense of my own righteousness or for my own benefit. It, it is directed towards the benefit of somebody else. So, in that, we, we wanna open up, and we're gonna look today through Romans, and then we'll look into some of the Psalms, see what they say, and, and uh, Paul is speaking by the Spirit, through the Spirit, is saying everything that's in the Old Testament. There's nothing new, and he's not delivering uh, new instructions, and the same as me. It's, it's not that I've came up with this new idea. All this stuff is within the Bible, and if you implement it to your life, you will find the recovery you're seeking for. You will be restored. You will be redeemed. You will be able to put on Christ and, and become a new creature, a new creation in the eyes of the living God. And in this world, this will transform your life for the positive, for the good. So I want to start here with Romans, and we're going to go through Romans, a little bit of Romans 12 and some of chapters 13 and Romans 12 verse 9 starts right here like this let love be genuine abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor and do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now, if you go back two videos ago or two messages ago, and the last message, we know we talked about how discerning and where does my discernment come from and how we had our fundraiser. It, perfect timing, right? 
it's all perfect timing as according to God and how God works and the message and that. Because, you know, I, I focus on each step as they come. I don't pre-focus on step nine when I'm back there working on step six. I, I'm During the step nine, I'm completely dedicated to step nine, spiritual goodness, and down the line. So last step was step eight, patience. We, we spoke a lot about that and, and being patient and, and how God being alive in my heart and my life is producing the patience of God. If you haven't seen that, go back and check it out. And then, you know, we had our fundraiser send out letters to 20 different churches, every church in our community and neighboring communities and all around through Yuma County, which was about 20 uh, we send out all the letters and make phone calls to the churches and, you know, telling them, if nothing else, come down and meet me. Just just come and meet me. Show, show some respect and honor by saying that I came, I saw, and I was here, <laughs> you know. Uh, just, just simply come and meet me. I, I'm... I'm I, I'll, presenting to you an opportunity for me to introduce myself to you and for you to introduce yourself to me. And, and yet, outside of one family and one church, the Assembly of God, zero response, zero. You, you, you don't exist, you're not welcome, you're not wanted, leave our community, zero. Other than one pastor who saw it as an opportunity to insult me, and it was 100% uh, uh, an act of, let me insult you, let me take the time to break you down, let me take the time to, to explain to you why I'm superior, why people listen to me, and why nobody's ever gonna listen to you because you have no true value in this community, and the value comes from the acceptance and the approval of people, not that of, of God or Jesus Christ. And so the preachers and the teachers, they, they're always preaching to a people for their acceptance, for their approval. And so they won't preach against sin. Instead, I just want to preach to you a nice soft message that, that you will enjoy listening to because in that, I find great comfort and value in being able to pay my bills. And for them, it's about money. It's all about money and has nothing to do with helping anyone out of sin. They don't preach against sin. Instead, they try to justify sin by saying, well, it's okay, we all live in sin. We, we all slander our neighbors a little bit, you know. These small communities, hey, that's the life it is. We, we gossip, that's what it is. And that's why you come to church, just so you can come here and, and wave your arms around while we're singing. Uh, you, you, you find great joy in singing psalms, and uh, thank God, Jesus Christ has forgiven you, and now you have free reign, a free license to just live in sin. I mean, thank God Jesus Christ has forgiven you. That way you can go out and, and continue in the gossip, and you continue in the slander. And real folks who have real issues like me and you and we're seeking real recovery and real healing and we, we are, are broke down emotionally and, and spiritually and we're looking to find redemption and to be restored emotionally and spiritually we come to these churches that, that are stuck in the apostasy can't find anything beneficial there for us they're not going to heal us. They don't care about us. They have no compassion, sympathy, or empathy. And, and so I come, and, and, and then I leave 
never to return. And thereby, so many people don't find recovery. They don't get the help they need. Because one, nobody contributes to the needs of the saints. They, they, don't, they don't actually participate in actively contributing to these things. So these are things that what we're talking about are the production of a spirit-filled per person. Spiritual goodness is an action. It is an action, it's not a statement. As I say, for me, it, it, it is a way of life. It's not a job. It's a way of life. And so when you're a, a spirit-filled person, we surrender our will for the will of God, and, and then God works through us, and, and he does his thing, and, and we're just a, a surrendered vessel allowing him to use us in whatever way that may be. And so we see in there what that way should be and what it should look like. Goes on to say, verse 14, Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil, no evil one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge, avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And again, you know, a part of the uh, actively being a person who is spiritually filled with the goodness of God it is an act of selflessness when you say to those living in sin, hey, please stop sinning because you're walking down a path of destruction and because I care for you, I'm trying to prevent you from going down that path of destruction. That's why I write a letter and mention to the guy who decides to insult me instead of help me and speak to him, it's not about judging people. It's not about being angry or upset or repaying evil for evil. <laughs> let's be honest and let's be real. There's a reason people aren't finding recovery. There's a reason people aren't being healed. So let us be honest about why they're not getting what they need. And that way we could be honest with what is the solution for what they actually need? What is it they desire? How are we going to deliver to them that sense of recovery or help? If we're not even going to acknowledge that maybe sometimes the problem isn't with them who are suffering from the side effects of being abused as a child. The problem might be me who can't see the value in those people who are suffering. And so that's, that's where we speak of these things is as me as being a preacher and a pastor and a person uh, who desires to deliver a sense of recovery, redemption to those who are suffering, how do I do it? How do I do it? And, and, and I'm, I got to be hospitable care and tend to the needs of the saints. And, and Paul saying, do good. Even if that person ha has 
persecuted you or, or see you as being their enemy, you do good unto them. That's what it the, the, the defines being spiritually good. When we're talking about this spiritual goodness and the goodness of, of God, we're not here to repay evil with evil, but to overcome evil by doing good. And that's my prayer and would hope that you would come to find here at this church that, you know, we're, we're not here to shame you or, or make you feel bad for whatever situation you're in. We're, we're simply focused on your well-being and the recovery and the process of recovering from the side effects that come from childhood abuse. And those are very debilitating side effects. And they can last an, an entire lifetime, especially if we're in a place of denial or don't want to deal with it. And, and most churches and most pastors and people, preachers, right, they don't want to deal with anybody's problems, especially the problems of the people standing in front of them, right? If we're going to deal with problems, let's deal with people's problems living in Africa or, or some other country or some other place. And all the people in the congregation are dealing with problems. Well, I don't want to deal with your problems. In fact, I, I bound myself to a law that says that, that I am prevented from helping in dealing with the problems of the people in front of me. This is why people aren't finding recovery. This is why redemption seems to be so far off. Why people aren't getting healed in the churches anymore. You got a bunch of fake phony preachers and you listen to them because they tell you what you want to hear instead of talking about the things you need to know. So chapter 13 says this, Book of Romans, that every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rules are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Isn't that interesting? And God is the ultimate authority. Having a, a, a subject or, or um, a surrender to the authority of God, the rules and the laws of God, and, and recognizing and understand, right, the, the police are supposed to protect us. The, the army is supposed to protect us for, for our good and our well-being. And the police don't go running around arresting people for doing good or right. You, you break the law, then they come and, and they take them away. And, and why do they take them away? Because their bad behavior is usually endangering the people around them. So all of it is designed to protect. But now if the law comes along and says, I prevent you from helping others. I prevent you from, from uh, attending to the needs of those around you, to the saints. I, I prevent you from being hospitable. Though that comes from the devil, <clears throat> and that is lawlessness. That's lawlessness, and that's why Jesus speaks about the lawlessness of this world and those who partake in lawlessness. Again, we were talking in the last video about the good shepherd, or, or excuse me, the good Samaritan, who does good for the person who was vulnerable and left dead, and the priest and the lawyer were, were bound by the law and, and so prevented them from helping the guy. Well, those, that's, that's not a law coming from God. <laughs> That's the law of the devil. So again, our fight isn't against flesh and blood. 
it is against the principalities and the rulers of the governments in this world who, who try to enforce laws that rob us of our value. The laws are supposed to be there for our good, not our destruction. And so we got to have a sense of discernment, and our discernment comes from the Bible. Sometimes there are laws that were meant to be broken. Paul is thrown in prison most of his life. <laughs> Many times does he visit prisons. Peter was thrown in prison. Many times was visited prisons. And it was because they did the right thing. And in this wicked and evil world, being ruled by demons and devils, prevented them from doing the right thing, but they were willing to take on the punishment of, of breaking the law because the person they were trying to help, the people they were trying to help, mattered more, had more value than the, this arbitrary law that prevented them from doing good. So, so we got to recognize and understand where is our allegiance? And when we're talking about having an allegiance with God and surrendering our will and our prosperity for the sake of God's will, God is going to always produce, and the Holy Spirit is always going to produce love. And a great sense of love and it's always going to produce something for the well-being of everyone. And that's what it's meant to do. As he goes on to say, listen to this. Would you have no fear of the one who is, who is in authority? Then do what is good. And you will receive his approval for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger of who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, you must be subject in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. And, and that's why our Father's House of Prayer is not a non-profit uh, organization. We don't belong to that because in, here in America, when you sign the, the government papers that say, oh, this church is a nonprofit organization, you signing away your liberty. You're, you're, you're signing away your right to preach the Bible without fear. In fact, if you say something that this, this, the government disapproves of, they can come in and seize your church, your property, and all your stuff, and throw you in jail because you spoke against them or, or spoke against their, their wicked rules or laws. And so people who sign away their liberty also take on their rules and their laws and place them above the rules and laws of God. And then all of a sudden they're prevented or prohibited from helping people. Here we pay our taxes just like everyone else. And, and, and it's not like we are here for a profit. Every money dollar we got that comes into here goes to the people here, to the needs of the people here. And you say, well, you're not 
contributing to my needs, well, you're not here. Come on down. Come in and, and live here with us, and you'll see that we do contribute to your needs. We will be hospitable to you. We will love you and care for you. So verse 8, chapter 13, Romans says this, Oh, no one anything except love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covenant, or any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so in all of it, when we're a person who is spiritually filled with the goodness of God, what motivates us, what directs our steps, what guides us, ultimately is love. And I don't think any of us can express a sense of love to another person unless we see the value in that person. We, we recognize, hey, this person matters, and because they matter, I'm going to give them love and help, and I'm going to do good things for them. Not because I'm good or I'm righteous. Instead, it's because they have such value. I do these things. And their value comes from God. And that's why <laughs> spiritual goodness is step nine. All right. First, in all the other eight steps, it was about us recognizing our love for ourselves. In, in, in the recovery process, I, I can't find recovery, I can't find healing and redemption until I believe first I'm worthy of it. And in order to be worthy of it, I gotta love myself. Not the narcissistic, selfish sense of love, but that the recognition and understanding that I am one of the beloved children of God. And if God so loves me, what's stopping or preventing me from loving myself. And then once I recognize and understand my value and my worth and that I matter and, and, and the depths of my own love for myself and I begin to see how can I love myself while I'm actively destroying myself through an, an addiction of, of drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be. And I recognize that, well, in order for me to love myself, I gotta care about myself. I gotta care about my health and my well-being. And I don't wanna live in a gutter anymore. I want to be raised up out of the gutter. And so I can live righteously in a place of, of honor and I can honor myself and, and be able to receive honor due from other people and respect for myself and respect that may be due from other people. And so once I, I get right with myself and, and loving myself, now here in this place of spiritual goodness, now, now I'm able to begin to love others as I would have them love me. And that includes our enemies or, or those who persecute us. To love others as I would have them love me. And, and that's what was so shocking and disturbing for me, being a, a pastor, a preacher, a, a man who has dedicated his life to Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the salvation of other people, that the people of this community, and not just anybody, guys, not just any group of people in this community, but the pastors, and the elders, and the deacons, and the bishops, the choir, the Christian community, 
rejected me in, in every single way. That was utterly shocking and disturbing and concerning. And then I look out in the world and I look at all the people who are, who are being abused by their spouses, the children being abused by their parents. The people living in homelessness, hopelessness, alcoholism and drug addictions. And it's a staggering number, millions Millions of people all across America, not just in America, but the whole world. It's probably close to a billion people worldwide. And, and, and how can this be when, when we, we come and we worship and we love such a good God who loves righteousness and, and justice and and has a sense of goodness within him. How, how is this going on? Well, somewhere along the line, love has died. Love is dying. That the sense of being spiritually good is dying. And, and what is it? People become baptized in water and they're always given approval to the preachers and teachers they, they desire because, you know, I'm not going to believe in, in the God who is. Instead, I'm going to believe in the God I approve of, which is idolatry, and nobody gives help. Nobody finds recovery. Nobody knows what love is anymore because you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you, you must be, have been baptized in the Holy Spirit to be able to generate the fruits of the Spirit. If we live in a society that is void of, of the spiritual goodness of God, we live in a society that is utterly collapsing and going to begin to devour itself. And that's kind of what I've experienced in living here in Ray, Colorado, is living in a community that seeks to devour itself instead of raising up within itself healthy women and healthy men, mothers, fathers, and people who generally care for one another. And it's tough when your mother and your father don't care for you. And that's pretty prevalent in these communities that moms and dads are pretty abusive out here. So love is extremely important. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from a sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So when we're talking all the stuff about putting on the armor of light, we're, we, or I, have, have put it together in such a way that it's seen as we're putting on the jasper stone, the sapphire stone, the agate stone, the emerald stone, which is represented by faith, integrity, sacrificial love, and innocence, righteousness, and cleanliness. We're, we're putting on these 12 steps, and in that, we're, we're igniting the, the fire of God's all-consuming. We're surrendering from the works of darkness, the old things that used to define us. We're taking off that clothing and we're putting on Christ. Which gives us the, the confidence and the strength to go out into this world to be a representative 
of what it means to be one of God's beloved children, restoring in this world a sense of righteousness in goodness, salvation, salvation, deliverance, being delivered from sin, not empowered to live in sin, but delivered from it. And when we say we're going to be delivered from out of sin, uh, um, sin should make me sack. Being uh, swamped in alcoholism and, and drug addiction and, and depression, that should make me sack. It should make me sick because it's tarnishing my value. I have value because God so loved me. He gave me Jesus Christ so that in Christ I could find redemption, salvation, deliverance. And so this is the armor we're, we're dressing ourselves in. The new Jerusalem. The kingdom of, of God. Goes on to say, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. And that's what we've been doing, and that's what we've been talking about and going over over the past nine steps. And all of this, it's all biblical, it's all right here. We gotta implement it to our lives, we gotta apply it. It's a tool, and the tool is used to be worked, and the tool is usually used to work something that we wanna fix. And what we want to fix is ourselves. And once I'm fixed, I can begin to work on fixing my family. And once my family's fixed, we can work, begin to work on our co-workers, our community, or whatever it may be. And that's why these small groups and becoming, coming to the meetings and, and the support system and all of it is, there, there are people who are on step one, there are people on step six, there are people who have graduated and, and are out and about doing the thing. <clears throat> but all together and at the different levels that we're at, we're supporting one another, we're helping one another, we're sharing our experiences with one another, our successes, our failures, our feelings, our emotions. And all of it, we're bringing God and manifesting him in the group. We're making God present in the group. And in doing that, we, we see one another's value. We recognize and understand that, that not only do I matter, but you matter, and you matter, and you matter. We all matter, and we matter to God. And how do we know we matter? Because we've been motivated by the Holy Spirit to reach out and do the things we need to do in order to find the recovery we so desire. It comes through an act of love. And so when we're talking about the spiritual goodness of God, it is the manifest, manifestation of God's love, God's presence, flowing from our heart. We are becoming a spiritual a spiritually filled person who is dedicated to the goodness of God. Agatha Suni. <laughs> Agatha Suni is what all of this is about. The spiritual goodness of God alive in, in, in our hearts. Now, if you were here and we were at the meetings, this is where we have the opportunity to begin to 
talk and, and to fellowship with one another and and to discuss these things and to see how how can we implement this this stuff to our lives because that that's the part that that, that I'm so concerned of uh, about living in Ray is nobody seems to see this as being important uh, 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 let me explain to you one last little story and then we'll get going and we join us Sunday all of this be wrapped up Sunday morning at the services uh, so we had our fundraiser my sister and my dad every now and then they go to the local bar and there's one bar in town and they go to the local bar to watch the Broncos football game because here and out here where we are, you, you don't get free television and we love the Broncos and aren't able to watch Broncos football anymore because this town sucks. <laughs> you know, and uh, so go over there to watch the game and, and the bartender lady pretends to be your friend and is all oh, very nice and whatever, real loud mouth kind of a person. And, and there we have our fundraiser. She lives two doors down the, from us. And, and all day driving back and forth and, and in that, couldn't even wave to say hi. And I wave and we wave and we make sure, you know, we're gonna wave, we, we want you to acknowledge us. Won't do it. Well, and leaves a post on Facebook like the very next day and, and says, you know, my bartender's bag was was stolen. And bartenders, I don't even know what a bartender's bag is, but apparently because she works at the bar, what she's doing is claiming ownership over one of her co-workers at the bar and saying, my bartender's bag, well, one of the co-workers' bag was stolen, her purse or whatever. I said, you know what's funny about that is you had an opportunity all weekend long to, to prove yourself as being a good neighbor. Just a, a kind neighbor by waving and saying hello, and, and you chose not to do that. And, and what, what, what I love about reading your story is my God is good. God is so good. How dare you say God is going to punish me because I didn't come to your fundraiser. And it wasn't about coming to the fundraiser. It's about showing a sense of neighborly kindness to another person. And they could be very upset and offended. And oh, why would God punish me for this? Because you're living in sin. And it's not about God punishing you. It's, it's because you have removed yourself so far from God, you're now living outside of the protection of God. In the same way, David says, well, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he stands up against and defies the armies of God when he's speaking about Goliath? You're not inside the protection of God. And that's why you suffer all these consequences. And, and it's good to know my God is good. He protects over me and keeps me safe. But for those who lack the ability to show a sense of neighborly kindness, they're always in a place of turmoil. They're always in, in a place where life is a struggle. And they're always subject to the attacks of the devil. Always. My God is good. That's why I don't go to church because of pieces of shit like you. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, whatever. Excuse me for ever thinking you're a Christian. I'll never, I'll never uh, accuse you of being a Christian again. How's that, right? And it was funny because five other people from the town, they all jumped right in and was ready to fight. And, and attacking me and how worthless and a bad preacher I was. And oh, if you were a good preacher, you would have just let it go and prayed for them. And 
No, here's the problem. That's, that's, that's the apostasy being taught in this community. That, that nobody wants to stand up against sin. Nobody wants to say, you know what? Sin is what makes this world disgusting. That's the apostasy being taught here. And that's what I told them. Is that's why I'm here. I'm here to put an end to the false teachings and the false gospel being taught in this community. It is false. And taking a stand against sin, there's no evil in that. There's no evil in that. This world would be such a better world, our community would be in such a better community if we actively loved one another as we would have them love us. We, we expressed a sense of good and, and genuine brotherly love to others because that's, that's what I desire, is to be loved and respected and cared for. That, that's what we need is men and women in our communities to stand up and take a stand against sin, not repaying evil with evil, but by blessing others with the sense of spirit's goodness, the goodness of God. So when we're saying raining the coals, what are, what are the coals we rain out on them? God's goodness, God's love. We will overcome the evil of this world through a desire to actively participate in the spiritual goodness of God. Your goodness and mercy follow me. Your goodness and mercy follow me. You anoint me the Spirit of God who anoints me from the top of my head down to my feet my cup overflows with your love your goodness and mercy follow me your goodness and mercy follow